Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Welcome to the Ashcraft EMS EMT School Pre-Academy for EMT students. My name is Ray Ashcraft. I'm an EMT school instructor, a licensed paramedic, and the creator of Ashcraft EMS. Ashcraft EMS is a solution-based company focused on supporting EMTs at the start of their career. We help EMTs pass EMT school, the NREMT, and have a healthy, long-lasting career in EMS. Today, you are going to be participating in a workshop that creates a solution to a long witness problem of EMT students being ill-prepared for the start of their EMT program. EMT school is so fast paced and the information is so dense that it catches a lot of students off guard. And I have witnessed and a lot of programs have witnessed that EMT students feel that they're behind the eight ball on the very first day of class. A lot of students don't realize how much information is being thrown at them, what the expectations are of the class. And today's focus is illuminating all of those pitfalls so that we can be successful in class. We are gonna go over all of the who's, the what's, the when's, the where's, the why's, and the how's of EMT school so that you're excited and empowered on your first day of class rather than um, riddled with anxiety, right? And so I'm super grateful for the opportunity to share my experiences with you, share my knowledge, and this is going to be a really fun, engaging, interactive session. So let's get started. Before we even get started, the very first thing I want to do is I want to express some gratitude and just say thank you for choosing to go to EMT school. This is not something that you're being made to do. This isn't, you know, um, grade school. This isn't high school, college. This is something that you are choosing to do. You're choosing a life of service. You're choosing to help your community. You're choosing to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Typically, the people that I find that are gravitating towards public service, towards EMS, towards a career in fire, nursing, healthcare, anything like that are genuinely good people and they're following their hearts. And I think that that's something that's worth acknowledging. I think that's very brave of you to sign up for EMT school. I think that knowing that there's going to be challenges, that you're going to go into potentially stressful career path, you're going to be seeing things that we aren't really supposed to see, and you're going to be running towards danger when other people are running away is something to to acknowledge. And so before we even get started, thank you from the bottom of my heart for signing up for this. Everyone knows that we need EMTs out there, and um, especially right now. And so for you to still hear the call and answer, I think that's just really awesome. Thank you. In order to become successful in EMT school, I think that's important that we talk about what is EMT school. And in the next video, we'll talk about what isn't EMT school, right? And so EMT school is a place where we go to learn how to become an emergency medical technician. And so an EMT usually works on the ambulance and we provide emergency care to people who are experiencing either medical or traumatic emergencies. And so the most common place that they work is on the ambulance. It's either two EMTs or is an EMT and a paramedic. Uh, sometimes there's EMTs that work on the fire department. Um, there's EMTs that work inside the hospital like ER techs. There's a lot of positions that are available and we'll discuss that further on later on in, in, this, um, in this workshop about places that you can work as an EMT. EMT school is basically, in my opinion, a means to an end for a lot of people. A lot of people um, kind of have misconceptions about what EMT school is, and they think that it is a place where they're going to be receiving almost like hand-holding education in the process of becoming an EMT. And unfortunately, that's not really the case. And so EMT school is a place where you are going to provide, a, you're gonna be provided a mixture between lectures and hands-on practice to prepare you to take what's called the National Registry exam. And so in your path to becoming an EMT, the first thing that you need to do is you need to go to EMT school and you need to get a certificate of completion for EMT school, and that's where we are gonna come into play. So in the EMT program, you're gonna go, whether the, it be night classes, virtual classes, um, in-person all day, a full week, whatever your program has, you're going to 
be having a mixture of sitting in class, a mixture of doing hands-on skills, and then a mixture of practicing scenarios to prepare you for your test. EMT school offers you the minimum amount of hours required for you to be eligible to take your national registry exam. And so with that being said, I need you to understand that EMT school is really self-led. You are going to have to put in a lot of study time on your own in order to be successful. It is impossible for an EMT instructor to pour the information into your brain and you be able to absorb all that is required for you to learn how to become an EMT just by sitting in class. And so oftentimes classes are usually fast paced, highly impacted, and students are needing to put in about four hours of extra study time per day to be successful. So um, this is your book that you'll be getting and all of this information needs to be absorbed um, within the course of your program. So my program is nine weeks long. And so we really hit the ground running. And so I need you to understand that before you even start EMT school, you're going to need to allocate and dedicate a lot of time outside of class in order to be successful. So to dovetail onto the last slide of what EMT school is, uh, you need to understand what EMT school is not. And so EMT school, like I said, is not a place where you are going to receive all of the information from your lead instructor or your skills instructors. We are there to supplement your learning process. There's just not enough hours, not enough seat time, not enough ability in the instructors to teach you these concepts, which are pretty in-depth concepts about pathophysiology, medications, triaging, prioritizing. We're cultivating an entire mindset for you. And a lot of the information that's in the book just needs to be read and needs to be practiced with flashcards and um, study groups and things like that. And so EMT school may be a little bit of a shock for you if you have never experienced um, self-led type learning like this. And so from what I've witnessed with the EMT students is the people that usually gravitate towards trade schools or a school like EMT school are typically students who were um, not that studious in high school. I mean, there might be a reason why you're not going to college. And so what I've found is that a lot of students find themselves um, kind of in qu quite a shocking predicament when they think think that EMT school is going to be something that's, oh, if I'm just there, I'm going to get a pass. This isn't like Boy Scout summer camp where you're just going to learn some first aid and it's kind of just like we're playing around. Um, this is this is some really in-depth concepts and, and training. And so what my students uh, who struggle often find is they're like, wow, I didn't do very good in high school. And now... I'm like double down in school. I'm learning more than I've ever had to be required to learn. I'm being forced to learn it on my own. The pace is dizzying and it's, and I don't, I'm not equipped. I don't have the study tools and the study habits to be successful. Uh, so we need to mentally prepare for that. And so that's the purpose of this um, pre-academy is for me to help you understand what you're getting into and give you the tools and the resources to do this. Now, I will say that if you listen to what I say and you do and you apply yourself and you apply the study tips that I'm going to share with you later on in this um, in this training, you can be successful so long as you put in the time. I've seen so many students who classify themselves or identify themselves as bad test takers or bad students. I have helped them step into the best versions of themselves and realize that they they weren't bad students. They just didn't know how to study. So I'm really excited to share that information with you. Now we're going to talk about what type of material is covered in EMT school. And so 
basically we can break down the book or we can break down the weeks into nine different sections or nine different weeks. Now, some of these are going to overlap. Some of them are going to, we're going to jump forward and we're going to jump backwards, but these are the main chunks of what we're going to be covering in each week. And so we're going to really hit the ground running in week one. And I need you guys to mentally prepare for this is week one is going to cover EMS systems things like the legal aspects of EMS, the history of EMS, what we are, what um, the fire department is, what the paramedics are, um, basically what our role is and, and what we're doing here. We're going to cover communications and documentation. So that's a lot, talking about how to talk on the radios and how to document our paperwork. And then it's going to get super heavy covering medical terminology and the human body. And so week one is pretty intense and it covers 336 pages of the book okay and so i need you guys to understand that that's a lot of material and so it's important that you you know took this pre-academy class so you understood that because you're just gonna, you're going to want to read beforehand you're going to want to get a jump on this if you wait until the first day of class for me to tell you that this is what's coming up it's going to be a lot of material to cover in just week, one week, especially if you're running multiple timelines, you're going to other programs, uh, I mean, sorry, other schools, you have jobs, you have families, you have kids, things like that. So week one, 330 pages covers all basically what we're doing here. Week two, we take a little bit of a break and we cover 103 pages and we learn CPR and we learn what patient's assessments are. Week three, we go into airway management. Week four, we go into pharmacology. Week five is shock and resuscitation. Week six is medical. That's another big one of 300 pages. And then week seven is trauma, which is 340 pages. Week eight is OB, gyno, and special population. So we're going to talk about childbirth and um, uh um, neonatal emergencies. And then we're going to finish off with section nine, which is about 150 pages of EMS operations and hazmat, um, how to drive the ambulance, things like that. And so it's basically going to be a big chunk. And then the smaller ones where we have less pages to cover, we're then going to be supplementing with a lot of hands-on stuff. So for instance, airway management in week, week four is only 40 pages. But we're going to be doing a lot of hands-on. We're going to be talking about how to maintain airways, suctioning, dropping airways into people's mouth, oxygenation, all kinds of stuff. So anywhere that it's not heavy on book reading, it's going to be heavy on application. All throughout this, we'll also be practicing scenarios, doing group study activities, and um, practicing um, in preparation for our tests. So there's a lot going on. So in the next slides, we're going to go over each week or each section and tease out what's most important and mentally prepare you for what is going to be coming for those weeks. All right. So section one or week one, we're going to be going over EMS preparatory. All right. So the concepts that are in these chapters are going to be everything that we need to know as an umbrella understanding of what EMS, emergency medical services or uh, systems, what an EMT, paramedic what is all about. And so we need to fully understand what we are doing here. And so we're going to cover EMS systems, workforce safety, medical, legal, and ethical issues, communication and documentation, medical terminology, the human body, lifespan development, lifting and moving patients, and the team approach to healthcare. And so I'm going to break up each of these into each chapter um, with each video because I just recorded this whole thing and just deleted it all. So um, we're going to start off with Chapter 1, EMS Systems. So in Chapter 1, we are going to learn basically what the whole system of EMS is about. We're going to learn what it means to be an EMT, what the different levels of service are. So there's the first you know, a medical responder, an EMR emergency responder, an EMT, an advanced EMT, a paramedic, um, nurses, doctors, medical directors. We need to understand who and what everybody is. We need to understand what they can do what they can't do, how we can serve and help with them, and 
um, all of those types of things. We're going to learn what our scope of practice is, which means what we can do and what we can't do. We're going to learn about the history of EMS, how it came about. Um, we're going to learn what we do as EMTs, so how we size up a scene, patient assessments, what we do with treatment and transport. Um, we're going to uh, learn about the other aspects of emergency medical services, so dispatchers, human resources, um, publics, the public's contribution to emergency services, uh, legislation and regi regi regulation, um, how we educate the public, um, how we evaluate ourselves, so things like qu continuous quality improvement or CQI, what that means to uh, basically check our work, check the data, make sure that what we're doing is the best it can be, and that's how we make our changes. Uh, we're gonna talk about a thing called HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which basically means that we are legally required to uh, maintain patients' privacy when taking care of, of them, which is something that I think that we all would wanna do. Uh, we're gonna talk about what it means to be professional, how to look professional, how to act professional, um, and those are gonna be the topics that are be covered in chapter one. Chapter two, we're gonna be going over workforce safety and wellness. And so chapters one, two, and three, and some of four is gonna be a lot of common sense. And so in some ways, um, it's a little bit of a breeze. Uh, if you haven't been living under a rock, you're gonna have a pretty much understanding of how to move and function through life. Um, but we are gonna to need to cover these topics. And so chapter two involves wellness. And I hope that you guys are on a path of wellness and you know what things are good for you and what things are bad. Um, but we are gonna make sure that you are understand what you stress and distress is, which is like good stressors, like exercising and um, uh, things like that versus bad distress, which is like um, drinking and smoking and doing you know bad things like that. We're gonna be talking about nutrition, or exercise, um, staying hydrated. Again, it might be a little bit boring concepts to you, but it's, it's important. Uh, we're gonna talk about smoking, vaping, chewing nicotine, drug use, alcohol abuse, um, disease prevention, how to balance your work life, your family life, um, infectious diseases, how we can catch diseases. So things that are on tables, things that we need to get into our bodies, things that we need uh, that are airborne or bloodborne pathogens. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, reducing the risk of infection. So silly things like washing your hands, which I think we all know how to wash our hands, but you'll be surprised at the steps. You actually need to do quite a bit more than what we're probably doing um, on our own. Um, but we need to understand how to do it at an EMS, uh, EMT level. We're going to learn how to properly put on our PPE or per, per, wow, uh, personal protective equipment. So like goggles and gloves. And so uh, how to sterilize, how to disinfect. So we're going to need to have an understanding of uh, what it means to clean, to disinfect, to um, uh, sterilize, um, things like that. What to do with sharps and bloody objects, uh, how to, how to um, what to do if we're actually exposed to something. So what's our chain of command? Uh, we'll talk about scene safety. We'll kind of gloss over this, but this will be something we'll talk about a lot in class throughout the whole class, but we will open up the idea and the concepts of making sure that you're safe. So there's this thing called BSI scene safe, which is covered in this chapter is your body substance isolation, your PPE. You have to have everything on you to protect you and your scene needs to be as safe as possible so that you don't become a victim yourself. So in that, we'll talk about hazardous materials. Uh, we'll talk about scenes that are unsafe, like uh, it can be environmental scenes, it can be violent scenes, it can be crowds, things like that. Uh, we'll talk about, surprisingly, we'll talk about environmental stuff like tornadoes and lightnings, uh, earthquakes, uh, power down power lines, all those kinds of things, because we're gonna be teaching you to a national standard. And so for those of you who are in living in one state, 
you like, for instance, we're in California. We know about earthquakes, but we don't know nothing about monsoons or tornadoes. And so we might need to read up in that and really understand those things so that we're empowered enough to, to pick the correct answer on a test. Um, so chapter two, I think will be kind of fun topics. Um, and we'll be doing a lot of the paperwork and things like that that are required at the start of class, taking pictures and ID badges and all that kind of stuff. But we'll be making sure that we cover all of those topics in chapter two. So getting into chapter three, that's where we're going to discuss medical, legal, and ethical issues. So just like the last chapter, this is going to be a lot of common sense, but there'll be a few things that you're going to need to tease out and have firm understanding about in order for you to answer questions correctly on our quizzes and tests. And so we'll need to understand um, the concept of consent. And so that's a pretty common topic now, and I hope that you guys all understand what consent is, but you will need to understand the different types of consent. So there is informed consent, expressed consent, um, implied consent. Uh, we need to understand what equates to someone being able to have what's called decision-making capacity. And so if you're of sound mind, if you are acting normal, uh, you're uh, what's called alert to person, place, time, and event, you can ask, answer all those questions, then you have the right legally to choose what what is done to you or done for you. But if you're altered in some way, like maybe you hit your head or you're heavily intoxicated, something like that, then we as the first responders actually have the legal right to make medical decisions for you um, in your best interest. And so we need to understand how to um, cover that. We need to know when someone under that same kind of topic, when someone has the right to refuse. Um, some people have what's called advanced directives. So they have orders like a do not resuscitate order that says I legally am saying that, you know, if I were to um, suffer cardiac arrest or die, then I want to stay that way. I don't want you to save me. And so we need to understand all those legal, legal concepts, organ donors, um, medical alert bracelets, uh, um, what equates to uh, negligence, what's our duty to act, and abandonment. So uh, basically, we need to kind of understand the legal aspects of what we can and can't do, what will get us in trouble, and what things we are protected against. So relatively easy chapter. Um, three should be a breeze for you guys. Chapter four, another relatively easy chapter. Uh, so thank goodness, because uh, we're going to get into some pretty heavy ones on five and six. Um, but for this one, we're going to be talking about communication and documentation. And so in order to do our jobs well, we need to understand how to communicate well. And so I think that we all know how to communicate. Um, another kind of common sense chapter. But we do need to know uh, some different types of communication. So therapeutic communication, uh, we need to understand the differences in age, culture, and um, facial expressions, nonverbal communications, how to deal with aggressors, um, things like that. Uh, we need to understand so a lot of safety tips on how to talk to people. So you have to understand that we're going to be working around people who are experiencing some pretty serious events and within that people don't always act normal you know and so we need to have a lot of good de-escalation um, abilities and some good uh, communication skills uh, we're going to need to have uh, self-awareness to our body language and how we're behaving and how it can be perceived by other people. If we're standing there going, why did you call 911? Or if we're down on a knee and we're kind of approaching them at their angle, um, those kinds of things. So you need to learn how to show empathy and how to be a good listener, um, how to approach uh, young people um, because we can have that stranger danger vibe or how to um, talk to elderly patients. Uh, we'll talk about visually impaired um, patients and people who um, have any other types of um, uh, challenges with communication. Uh, we'll also talk about documentation. And so we'll talk about how we speak on the radio to give our radio reports and how to talk to the hospitals when we go do a turnover report to the nursing staff and how to 
document on our PCRs, our patient care report, all the things that transpired on our calls. And so there's a formula that we'll need to follow and kind of understand um, of basically the uh, who, what, when, where, and why of the call. And uh, also, what do we do if a patient wants to refuse care? Uh, we're also going to be talking about the different forms of communication. So this is one section of this chapter that's really challenging is uh, the different types of radios, uh, simplex, duplex, multiplex, what a scanner is, what a repeater is, what a base station is, uh, especially those of you who want to go into fire, we're going to be using a lot of different types of communication. So uh, we need to understand what those types of communication uh, equipments are and what their limitations or their abilities are. And so chapter four, um, I think, uh, has a couple challenges to that, but um, I think that if a couple flashcards and just kind of look through it, I think we can make through it. This is where it gets serious. All right. Chapter five, medical terminology and chapter six, the human body are the two areas that I would probably focus your attention prior to starting school. So one of the major benefits of you signing up for this pre-academy is getting insight and awareness to the fact that you can study some of this stuff early to give yourself the advantage. The other chapters, I think that you can you can breeze through or you can, you know, make it make sense on your own. But without any understanding of EMS or medical terminology or the human body, if you haven't taken an A&P class, if you're not pre-med already, if you're just a regular person like me who was not bound for college, um, medical terminology is going to really uh, put you on your back. And so if I were to suggest anything, it would be it would be studying chapter five and six prior to starting EMT school. So in medical terminology, we're going to review standard English. We're going to learn about prefixes, word roots, suffixes, and we're basically going to be learning medical Latin. And so you have to understand that we are going to be learning a whole new language throughout this course. And the sooner you can understand it, the better you're going to do in the class. Because we don't just say things like, oh, my knee hurts, we're going to say it's your patella. We're not going to say um, you're laying down on your stomach. We're going to say you're laying prone. We're not going to say you're laying on your back. We're going to say you're laying supine. And so we need to understand all of that kind of stuff. You will notice that there are a lot of words that we do not use um, in our regular lives that are going to be introduced in this EMT program. And so understanding what the root, the the, the meaning of the root and the example in it and putting that all together is going to get you quick, quicker to that click factor where you go, oh, I get it. And so an example of that would be like if us in medical in the medical field wanted to say that only one side of your chest was rising due to like an injury or something like that, we would say that you're having unilateral, unilateral chest rise. And so when you break down the word, uni means one, like unicycle, and lateral means sided. And so unilateral means one-sided chest rise. And so that needs to be ingrained in your brain because when I say that patient has unilateral chest rise, you need to be able to quickly process that and come up with an answer. And so... If you go to chapter um, five, page 168, you're going to see a great table that kind of breaks down all the different ones like unilateral, um, uh, preemie, like uh, preemie means first. So like uh, uh, premature would be the, an example of that. Multi, um, bilateral, tri, um, quad, those kinds of things are gonna really help you. It's also gonna cover cover some colors. So like for instance, if there's the word melon in there, it, it indicates black. If it says sero, it means yellow. Um, erythro is red. I don't know anybody who knows that kind of stuff before school. And so we're gonna to have to make some flashcards and kind of get an understanding of that stuff beforehand. We're also gonna be learning about the different 
uh, descriptions of the body. So I talked about this a second ago. The anterior is the front of your body. The back is your posterior. Um, an injury that was proximal to your body, closer to your body, is closer to the core. Distal is further from your core. Um, unfortunately, this is the language that we speak. And the reason for that is because there's no opportunities for misunderstandings when we all speak the same language. So it's important. We're going to learn about the different types of abbreviations that are appropriate. Now you're gonna to get to chapter five, page 176, and you're gonna see a giant table. I do not expect you guys to memorize this table, but I will tell you that you're gonna pretty much know them by the end of class. You're gonna probably know about 65% of them, which is something that you can you know, kind of look forward to without sitting there and studying every single one. Just by practicing and being around it so much and using the language, uh, you're gonna do pretty well. So I want you to take a look at that table at, chap at page 176. And I want you to look at it and see that this is like, this is an example of a mountain that you're going to look at and think that you can't climb. And I promise you by the end of class, you will know a majority of that and you will be standing at the top of it looking down. And that's something that that's pretty empowering, knowing that that's something that you're going to learn through this course. And so chapter five, pretty easy breezy, but we're, uh, I mean, uh, pretty challenging. Um, chapter six is gonna be a hard one. Um, and so we'll get into that one next. All right, y'all, so chapter six, this one's a doozy, okay? All right, this is where we're going to learn anatomy and physiology. So those of you who are like me, who did not have any real proper schooling, uh, this was a tough one for me to work through. And so I think that the majority of us know that we have a body, but I don't think we really understand how it works, right? And so in chapter six, the human body, we are going to learn not only how to identify the different planes of the body, the anatomical position of the body, um, all of that, but we're gonna talk about cells and how they work. We're gonna talk about joints. We're gonna talk about the muscular skeletal system. We're gonna learn about all the different bones in the body and how they work and relatively memorize each of those. We're gonna learn about all of the major muscle groups. Uh, I think that we know biceps, triceps, glutes, those kinds of things, but we're gonna need to know a few more of them. The heavy one is going to be um, the respiratory system. So in this chapter, the one that I want you to study first is going to be the anatomy of respiratory because that's gonna help us when we get into, um, let me see here, uh, chapter or week three, section three in airway. This is one that a lot of people have a little bit of, of trouble wrapping their minds around. So we need to understand how air moves in and out of our body. Airway management is one of our biggest topics in EMT school that we're gonna be covering. So if you don't even understand the mapping of it, you don't understand that the air goes in the nasal passage and the oral passage, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, meets at the back of the pharynx, goes down your trachea, and goes into your carina and splits off into the bronchi and the bronchioles, into the alveoli, into the air sacs. There's a process of diffusion, the exchange for oxygen and CO2. Whoa, there's a lot, right? So we have to go over all of that. We're gonna be learning about the nervous system and how that works. If there's something that you need to kind of understand in EMT school, it's gonna be that we are trying to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is like everything's chill, everything's at a seven, everything is happy. Our body wants to be there. So if something gets low, another thing's gonna kick in and try to bring it back up. If something gets too high, another thing's gonna kick in and try to bring it down. And so our job as EMTs is to recognize when someone is out of balance and then do things or give them things to balance them out so that they feel good. And so basically anytime that someone's having an emergency, they're either too high or too low in some capacity. And so having a firm understanding of what homeostasis is, of what being balanced is and what that looks like, it helps us more easily recognize when someone is out of balance. And if we can recognize the signs and symptoms of that, then we can implement a solution so that they can, they can get fixed. Aside from the airway anatomy, we need to understand the cardiac anatomy of the heart. And so we will need to memorize how the blood flows through the heart, the different parts of the heart and how that works. 
and what happens when it doesn't work. Because that is going to be the foundation, the baseline for us understanding a lot of uh, disease processes like heart attacks, congestive heart failure, pulmonary embolisms, all of these kinds of things, right? We're going to learn about all the different organs in our body. So what's the pancreas about? What's the liver all about? Um, the reproductive organs, uh, quite a bit in the human body. So if I had advice for you, it would be, first of all, understanding what you're getting into. So what is an EMT in general? but then medical terminology and the human body. And I think that that's where you should focus the majority of your attention starting today prior to school and be continuing to studying throughout that because it's gonna take us a while to get to that click factor. But I promise the sooner you get there, the better you're gonna do in class. Chapter seven is gonna be lifespan development. And so we're gonna take a little bit of a break after learning about all that serious human body stuff and we're going to kind of understand what the different age groups are. I wouldn't say that this is a very challenging one, um, but if you aren't around kids very much, like I didn't grow up around kids very much, so I didn't really understand, I didn't babysit or do any of that, so I didn't really understand, like, what's a toddler all about? What's an infant about? What's a three-year-old do? I'd be like, that looks like a baby. I don't know. They didn't know anything about it. So we're going to learn the different um, physical attributes to a person, uh, a newborn, all the way to elderly, and their their like mentality and their physical um, abilities. We're going to learn about their different age uh, vital signs, and so what's an appropriate blood pressure or heart rate for certain age groups, and how to kind of uh, in interact with them as an EMS professional. And so I think that this is a pretty good chapter, and it's, it's somewhat um, exciting, but it's, dude, it's only like Dude, it's only like 10 pages, so I wouldn't really worry about this one too much, um, but it will be beneficial to you uh, later on when we're preparing for National Registry because you do, there are a lot of questions that are surrounding, uh, these are the vital signs of this, so what age group is that? And so you will need to memorize that, but a couple flashcards, we can knock that out. So chapter seven, super easy. Chapter eight is going to be a pretty easy one. And so this is lifting and moving patients. And so I think that it's important that we cover these topics. I don't know if your school is going to have this be one of the ones that we're going to be quizzing and testing you on um, early on in the class, but they're definitely going to be concepts that we're going to be going over. And so I think that this chapter is pretty fun because we actually get to hands-on practice moving each other. And so we're going to talk about the different types of transporting patients, like utilizing something like a backboard over there, how to, to, to lift proper lifting mechanics, how to use a stair chair, how to emergency drag somebody, how to log roll somebody, um, uh, how to protect their C-spine or their cervical spine, their neck, in case they're in some type of um, uh, traumatic event like that. Um, but this is a pretty easy chapter, uh, lots of hands-on. Um, there's a few things, uh, the KED and stuff like that. But honestly, I think that we're going to cover this more when we get into trauma. So whew, eight's going to be a pretty easy one, and we'll finish off with chapter nine. Last one for section one is chapter nine, and this is the team approach to healthcare. And so, uh, again, I think this is going to be a relatively easy one. Uh, this is mostly common sense. It's just going to be talking about how to work in a team and the team dynamic, uh, effective communication, um, how what to do if maybe something's not going well on a call, um, if something is going well, how to make eye contact, um, what to do if you're having a conflict. Uh, wouldn't worry about this one too much. It's only like five, six, 10 pages, something like that. So no big deal, but that rounds out section one. And so just to recap, man, that was a lot of stuff. I totally get that. One, two, three, and four, relatively common sense. Five and six, heavy hitters. Seven, eight, and nine, more common sense. And so again, if I would focus your attention, it would be on getting a good bite out of medical terminology and human anatomy so that you can get ahead in the class. The rest you can fill in with probably reading the chapter once and making a few flashcards. So uh, let's, let's take a break and let's knock out section two next. Okay, section two is a huge section for us as EMT students. This is chapter 10, patient assessments 
and this is where we are going to learn how to perform an official patient assessment um, in school. At the end of your program, you will have to test out and perform a medical and a trauma scenario in order to pass the class and pass the NREMT psychomotor, uh, psychomotor uh, section of the exam. In this chapter, you're going to learn what an assessment is, how to size up the scene, how to take in all the information about where you are and what clues are available um, for you to have a better understanding of what's going on. You're going to learn how to do a primary assessment. So we would have learned CPR by now, but now we're going to learn how to um, assess the patient's level of consciousness, um, how to manage uh, serious bleeding, manage their airway, their breathing, and their circulation, how to make a transport decision, how to ask them questions to find out what's going on with them today, ask questions about what their past medical history is, how to do a full secondary assessment on the patient as a physical hands-on assessment to, to see if there's anything underlying that the patient wasn't able to articulate verbally. And then we're going to talk about all the different ways that we monitor and reassess our patients. So a lot of stuff in here. After you are in school and you've already started, we are going to start to build up towards this and this will be a common chapter that we will continue to be working on um, for the duration of class. So I would say in school, this is one of the main pillars of focus for the class is preparing for the medical assessment. If I were to ask any students what was the most challenging part of school or the part of testing that gave them the most anxiety or they didn't feel prepared enough for, I would say it's the patient medical assessment. And so I have a lot of great tips for you on how to be successful in your patient assessments. Uh, we won't need to go over those in here for the pre-academy, but you can reach out to me for assistance in that because that is exactly what I coach and work towards. Patient assessments and the medical and the trauma is absolutely my jam. And I have a system in place that can practically guarantee your success come test day. So um, that's exactly what this skill space was developed for and why I have created this this company to support EMT students is to give them access to practicing these medical scenarios uh, with a proctored instructor uh, so that they can get extra reps in during their assessment. So don't worry about that. When it comes to that time in class when we're gonna be going over section two, you let me know and I'll take care of you for that. But just be aware that that is going to be one of the things that we are going to be focusing on a lot in school. All of the learning that we've taken in the books is going to be applied to this section for us to be able to perform that medical assessment. All right, so section four is going to be chapter 12 where we talk about the principles of pharmacology. And so one of the things that we are able to do is give certain life-saving medications to patients um, so long as they meet the parameters and there's no contraindications. And so this is going to be a little bit of a rite of passage. This is gonna be one of those things similar to learning your medical terms that you're going to have to memorize. And so there's a handful of medications that us as emergency medical responders, uh, our emergency medical technicians and uh, first responders are able to give to patients uh, to reverse effects or have positive effects on uh, patients who are suffering certain illnesses. Activated charcoal, aspirin, nitroglycerin, epinephrine, oxygen, oral glucose, albuterol, naloxone, or Narcan, and some home meds are going to be the expectation. And so by now in section four, you would have had a pretty good idea of what you're doing there in class, and your instructor would have given you a drug formulary sheet that describes what each of these medications are and your the expectation to you is that you will memorize all of the indications 
the contraindications, the right route of giving this medication, uh, the right parameters of being able to give the medications, what can happen if something, you know, basically like uh, side effects that can happen and which medications don't work together. And so you'll be expected to be able to not only understand these medications, but also recognize all of the signs and symptoms that are associated with people who would need these medications, cross-reference them with your intuition and your protocols, and then implement these uh, or practice implementing these medications to your, uh, your patients and help them, right? And so uh, my suggestion for this one is that you write it out over and over and over, Bart Simpson style, and you write all of the information for each of these medications and you start practicing using them during your patient assessments. So are you starting to see the pattern where all of the pieces start to come together? Well, now we learned what our job is. And now we've learned who or what our role is in this job. And then we learned that there's a human being that we're trying to take care of. And we have a pretty decent understanding of that. And then we understand that there's a certain way that we speak and we act in this role. And then we realize that there's a certain airway management things that we can do. And there's a certain um, patient medical assessment that we need to perform. And then there's some medications that we're allowed to give. And so we're going to make sure that you start to put all the pieces together and you start to realize that, oh, I think I get it. I understand what my role is. I need to be able to identify what and what isn't an emergency, what the signs and symptoms are of the emergency, what I can do within my protocols to treat it, and what tools I have in my bag of tricks available to help this patient be better. And that's where pharmacology is gonna come in because you may sometimes feel like there's not a lot that you can do but there's definitely a lot that you can do wrong if you don't understand pharmacology. And so we'll help you with this kind of stuff as well, um, but this is gonna be one of those sections that's gonna require some attention. All right, so section five is going to be chapter 13, and we're gonna be talking about shock and resuscitation. And so in this chapter, we're going to learn what is shock, what causes shock, what the different types of shock are, the different stages of shock, and how to manage and recognize shock. And so in this, the, the, the point is going to be able to, is, is going to be us being able to recognize uh, when a person's body is out of homeostasis. So we talked about this before. It's out of balance, right? And so Basically, shock is when there is what's called hypoperfusion of the cells in our body. And so our body wants to work as a well-oiled functioning machine. It wants to move blood around our body and get good oxygenation to our cells so that we can function properly. And that any time that there's a problem with that flow of blood, a problem with with either the pump, the heart, the container, the body, or the fluid inside that circulation of our circulatory system, then we classify that as shock or hypo, here's that word, hypo, low perfusion, low oxygenation of the cells, right? And so the different types of shock are going to basically be um, a problem, like I said, with the pump failing, so the heart is having a problem functioning as a pump. So uh, something like mm, a heart attack or um, a blockage happening going in of the blood flow is going to affect the heart's ability to pump stuff out. Um, it could be a problem with uh, vascular function, so maybe a, a neurological shock or um, an anaphylactic shock reaction to where your whole body all over is being affected. Or it can be a problem with like low fluid, like low volume, hypovolemia, low hypovolemia volume. 
a, a loss of blood, like if you were to lose blood out, then there isn't anything to pump around. And so I think that this is a very fascinating chapter, and it's one that a lot of students have trouble wrapping their minds around. I think that you just need to take a moment to really just kind of understand that, oh, we're trying to maintain homeostasis, and whenever we can't, we have to figure out what is causing the um, the lack of function in our body. And so being able to recognize the signs and symptoms of these different types of shock, like anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, hypothermia, um, neurological shock, distributive shock, any of those things that are, that are causing our bodies not to function correctly makes it a lot simpler. It's a lot simpler than, than we make it out to be, but it's definitely one of the challenges I see a lot of students um, encounter in EMT school. So keep your eye on section five, shock and resuscitation. Don't be afraid to skim forward in the book when you're at week three or four to kind of get an idea of where it's going. The more you have an idea of where you're going, where you are and where you came from, the easier it's gonna be for us to get that overall understanding of the big picture of the complete um, total care of a patient. Okay, so now we're gonna get into section six, and this is medical. This is a huge section in EMT school that deserves a lot of time, but we are not gonna spend a lot of time in this like we did in section one, because this is the EMT school pre-academy, and it was important for me to discuss the topics um, surrounding section one because that is what you're going to be getting into and so we need to understand right away uh, the pace of the class in the beginning but uh, we are just going to gloss over this section but by no means do you need to take this chapter or these chapters rather lightly and so in section six medical we're going to go over medical overview which basically means what are what is a medical emergency, what constitutes for a medical emergency, and the different types in general. And then we're gonna spend a whole chapter of chapter 16 on respiratory emergencies, which is gonna cover all the different reasons why we can't breathe well or why we could not be breathing well. And then chapter 17, we're gonna go over cardiology. This is a huge chapter uh, where we need to understand how the heart works. So learning the blood flow of the heart and understanding how the body works and the respiratory because they're tied together is gonna to fold in together and it's gonna become very important and useful in the cardiac section. Then chapter 18, we're gonna go over neurological emergencies. So what happens if you have a stroke or a seizure or you hit your brain or mess up your spine and have a problem with that because your brain is your computer. What if your computer can't talk to your body, it's gonna cause your body to fail. Next is chapter 19, we're gonna go over a gastro, uh, gastro emergency, so stomach problems, and then urological emergencies. Uh, so like problems with your urinating and, and uh, um, your kidneys and problems like that. Um, and then we're gonna go over chapter 20. This one's pretty challenging for people to wrap their minds around. This is when we're gonna talk about diabetes. And so type one and type two diabetes, high blood sugar, low blood sugar emergencies, uh, concepts that are really hard for students to wrap their minds around. Um, but when we get there, we'll help you in that section there. But again, we're focusing on the beginning of class. Um, chapter 21 covers allergies and anaphylaxis. 22 talks about toxicologies. I think that's a really fun chapter for students because they get to learn about overdoses and things like that. 23 is pretty fun too because it's behavioral emergencies. You know the world's going mad. So uh, we're gonna learn about all the different medical um, problems that people can have with behavioral. And then we're gonna round it off with gynecological emergencies for chapter 24. That one is quite a bit of stuff. Um, but by then we're so far into school that we've got a good study grasp on school and uh, we can absorb these concepts a lot faster than we did in the beginning of class. All right, section seven is trauma. This is everybody's favorite section. This is chapter 25 when we will be going over trauma overview. So this is considered like the second half of EMT school. So we focus a majority of 
the beginning of class on what it is to be an EMT and medical emergencies. And then we kind of set that in stone and then we put that down and then we learn trauma. And then we, while we're learning trauma, we are also continuing the learning for medical and practicing those scenarios um, in our um, afternoon skills days. Uh, but we are now gonna introduce trauma. And this is all the stuff that people really get excited about in class. And so very easily digestible, a lot easier for people to grasp because it's very black and white. But we're going to be talking about all the different injuries that we can get, the different ways that we can assess a scenario, and we're, and uh, basically like the mechanism of injury. It's called the MOI, the mechanism of injury. So if someone gets in a car accident, we see a certain amount of damage to the vehicle what is that going to tell us to what kind of injuries this person may have sustained? Um, what the behavioral and the signs and symptoms are of someone who just experienced a head injury or a penetrating wound to the chest? What do we do if the insides are on the outsides? What do we do if there is splinting that needs to be done? And so at this point, by, by uh, this this section in school, we have, we've got a full stride going. We fully understand what we're doing here and we're excited to learn this kind of stuff and it's a breath of fresh air. We're like really pretty worn out um, with the medical stuff. And I'll tell you that the emotional roller coaster that you'll be riding through school, we are going to get some downhill. We're gonna get some excitement when we get into section seven for trauma. It's a huge look forward to for students. So um, won't need to go over that too much, but it's gonna cover bleeding and splinting and um, soft tissue injuries, facial injuries, how to stabilize patients, um, uh, face and neck injuries, head and spine injuries, and all of the fun stuff. So probably what you were most likely expecting to get into when you signed up for EMT school and definitely well-deserved by the time we get to this, this section. And it's going to be the second half of our skills that we're gonna to need to do at the end of the class in order to pass. So we'll need to perform a medical assessment and then we'll need to perform a trauma assessment. And we'll be working towards both of those goals through the duration of the class. Uh, but this is when we're gonna introduce trauma and we're gonna start getting it on uh, for putting pen to paper and physically uh, working on uh, these skills so that we can treat patients in a traumatic emergency. All right, so section eight and chapter 34 is gonna be OB and neonatal care, and we're gonna be learning about gynecological emergencies and childbirth. You know what, this is actually a section that surprises me each time. Um, I think that it's usually 50-50 on students. They're either like, man, I don't wanna have anything to do with that, or the students are really, really interested in the childbirth process. And so I think it's really fun to see the two different groups kind of uh, half cringe and half lean into the, the lectures, um, but we are going to learn how to deliver a baby and how to identify the signs and symptoms of a healthy and a um, challenging birth. Uh, childbirth in the field is actually an EMT skill, so um, it's necessary that we, we learn about this, this kind of stuff. Uh, be so, uh, I think that it's a really exciting chapter. Uh, we have child birthing mannequins and we role play what that looks like. And there's lots of great questions and a lot of videos that we can watch and, um, topics that can be discussed there surrounding this. And I think that, um, it is kind of a break, um, a break section in the class because we just finished trauma and uh, it's kind of a relief to uh, to have something that's kind of interesting to listen to and uh, kind of um, engaging because it's such a, a shocking topic I guess um, but OB and gyno is section eight and uh, we're almost finished section nine is the last one uh, you guys are doing great hanging in there uh, but we're almost finished so uh, cheers to uh, birthday, which is going to be uh, OB day where we will be practicing um, childbirth with the mannequins, and that's super fun.
All right, so we made it section nine. This is how we are going to round out our EMT school experience. Uh, we'll be talking about EMS operations and hazmat. And so basically after we've learned all of the information in school, we're now gonna kind of talk about how are we going to be implementing this out there in the field? So we're just gonna talk, just gonna talk a lot about how to drive the ambulance, um, how to uh, use some of the uh, equipment that we're not uh, really trained too much on initially out there in the field. What's the, the timeline of patient care? So what is the transport uh, experience like? How do we talk to our patients while we're, while we're going uh, to the hospital? How do we uh, practice safe driving uh, practices? Uh, going to and from calls? When do we use um, lights and sirens? How do we make turns? How do we stop efficiently? How do we uh, call for a helicopter or uh, wave in a helicopter or an airplane? Uh, how to get patients out of vehicles uh, when they are uh, stuck inside the car? So like extrications. Uh, we're going to be talking about hazmat, what to do if there's some uh, sketchy stuff that's going on uh, with chemicals. What do we do if there's what's called an MCI, a mass casualty incident? What do we do if there's a giant situation where there's a lot of people hurt in one space? How are we going to divide and conquer? So in the very, very beginning of the program, when we we're learning how to prioritize, how to triage, how we are cultivating our mindsets into thinking like an EMS professional, we'll be able to use those skills to stay calm under pressure and make smart decisions based on rationale on what is going to be best for the patient or for the group. Uh, there's lots of fun, exciting stuff to talk about um, in these chapters that I think a lot of students get a lot of benefit from, but that will round out this nine sections that you will be experiencing in EMT school. And so, before we close out with this section, I just want to say, I know it seems like a lot of information, but the way that it is staged out, it is manageable if you put in your time. So you'll notice that in these sections, we hyper-focused on the beginning chapters because that is what you're going to be experiencing first, but we still want to touch on all these topics so you have an awareness of what's coming down. You need to mentally prepare. So in the next section, we're gonna be talking about how to get your house in order, how to get your mind in the right space and how to manage your relationships, whether that be your personal relationships, your family, your friends, or your job to be successful and allocate the appropriate amount of time for this course um, in order to pass. So great job on completing sections one through nine and uh, we'll see you in the next one. All right, so now that we've finished what is going to happen in EMT school, we need to have a serious conversation about how to manage your relationships. There are several relationships that you're going to be trying to manage while you're in your EMT program. The first one's going to be with yourself, trying to maintain your, um, trying to maintain your balance, uh, trying to maintain your diet, uh, your mental stability, um, your time to things that you want to do, things that you have to do, um, that's going to be a challenge in itself. It's going to be a challenge for you to manage your relationships if you're in a partnership, if you have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a husband, a partner, um, a wife. Uh, it can be very challenging for you to maintain those relationships during these 5, 10, 6, 12, you know, semester-long um, EMT programs that you're going to be in. You're not going to be as available as you used to be and that's going to be a little bit of a challenge for them to adjust to if you do not have a serious conversation about the expectations. I must remind you that this EMT program for us is only nine weeks long. It's not the end of the world. It's just over two weeks. I mean, two months rather. And so I think that it pays a lot if you have a conversation at the beginning of the program and advise your people what you're getting into and ask for some grace, ask for some support and ask them to give you this, this break in the clouds, this moment in time to say, hey, for a little while, 
I'm going to have to be hyper-focused on this. And it doesn't mean that I don't love you or I don't want to be with you or around you. It's just that I need to save my bandwidth and my energy and my attention for this now because I'm working towards a goal that's going to better us in the future. All right. So now let's talk about how to study. So I think that this is one of the biggest issues that a lot of EMT students have when starting EMT school is the fact that they don't recognize just how much time they're going to have to put in studying in order to be successful in this class. I've already mentioned multiple times, it's going to take you about four hours of extra study time. But in reality, if you know how to effectively study, if you know what are the best ways to retain the information, you can reduce some of that time. But if you're really just putting it out there and and just putting in hard work instead of smart work, then it is definitely going to take you four hours of time. So here are my tips for being successful at studying. The first thing that you need to do is you need to have a firm understanding that the goal is comprehension and not memorization. As much as you're going to feel compelled to utilize Quizlet and memorize answers, to use flashcards and just do pattern recognition or word association, to do practice tests, to memorize the quizzes for when the mods come, uh, to... Uh, just remember that answers is not going to serve you the best long term and it's not going to help you reach that click factor. We talk about a lot about the click factor in EMT school. Typically, your book learning and your practice of your skills in class don't come to a spearhead until towards the end of the class. Students that work with me at coaching, they usually meet it around the six week mark, uh, maybe the five week mark. They hit that click and they go, oh, I get it. Most students on their own reach it about the week seven and a half, eight, and then the class is over and it's, it's done. It's a lot of time to be stressed out and going, why don't I just get this? And so working on comprehension, and really understanding each topic, you're going to recognize that it's all connected. And as soon as you just pick one topic, like how does the heart work or how do the lungs work? And you really comprehend a certain topic. It's going to be like that time when you exercise and the first time you put up a certain amount of weight and you're like, I never thought this was possible. And then you get it and you know that feeling and you can never lose it. Or that time that you've learned a certain skill that you thought you couldn't do and then you got it, you grasped it. And then you're like, wow, I understand this. I know this. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for that same kind of feeling, right? And so comprehension is going to be so important. So when you figure, when you go to each section, and each topic, it is better for you to spend more quality time focusing on really comprehending that subject than just reading the book multiple times. And so that would be my biggest suggestion on how to study. All right, so this is where we get to the good stuff. This is probably why you signed up for this pre-academy because you want to know the hacks. You want to know how to do it. These are the 10 things that are proven, that are what I believe are the best ways for EMT students to be successful in their studying. Starting with number one, you have to dedicate study time, okay? You cannot be distracted. You cannot be working at a Starbucks. You can't be at your house. You can't have family members, friends, uh, people walking around that is distracting you. You're going to have to find a safe space where you can quiet your surroundings and quiet your mind. And in that space, be able to focus. So if you want to wear AirPods and play binaural beats, play um, lo-fi music, play classical music, any of those kinds of things with no lyrics is going to be very helpful for you to zone in and focus on your testing. You got to have comfortable clothes. You have to have snacks. You have to have a comfortable environment, temperature. You have to have a comfortable seat, a good place to sit. You have to figure out a place where you can associate that space only with studying. It's very challenging to study somewhere where you 
do other things in that same space. Just like when you're at work, you need to be able to clock in. You need to find a place where you can clock in to work. Um, just so you guys know, at MySpace, I offer a place you have access to here with the Ashcraft Academy membership where you can come and you can clock in here and you can study in the back room um, solo um, in a quiet space. If that doesn't serve you or you're not in the Sacramento area, that's totally fine. I highly suggest going to a community college um, library, going to a state college library, going to um, a public library, or finding any type of quiet space like that. But you've got to clock in and you've got to lock in on that study time. All right, tip number two of the 10 best ways to study is to utilize batch studying. It's really beneficial if you can batch your studying and not sit there and just overstudy until until it's no longer effective. It's better if you can allocate moments of time where you can study efficiently, consistently throughout the week, rather than waiting until the weekend to cram study or right before the test. Uh, it's not very beneficial to study all night long um, and try to capture all that information last minute. And so Batch studying is going to keep you in a good mental space while you are studying. The second thing that's beneficial is to utilize a reward system. So you can either reward yourself for studying afterwards by saying, ooh, I'm going to, uh, well, actually, you can, you can do this beforehand, say, ooh, I'm going to reward myself a Starbucks, and I'm going to get happy and go to my study space and study, and that's my pre-reward for studying. Or you can reward yourself afterwards and say, I'm going to go take myself out to eat, or I'm going to go do something for myself after I've earned it studying. One reward that I like to do while I am studying is I like to, as we read the chapters, I like to put a gummy bear at the end of each of my paragraphs. And as I read a paragraph, if I finish the paragraph, and I comprehended it, it was a good read, then I get a gummy bear. And I do that as I go down and it has a double benefit to it because you'll learn this in school, but your brain runs on oxygen and glucose. So there's really nothing wrong with leaning on sugar a little bit while you're in school. I'm not a big advocate for sugar in your regular life at too much levels, but during this time, it's okay if you use a uh, you supplement with some sugar to kind of keep your brain fed. The next thing that I like to do for, um, for motivating myself to do some batch studying is to use the might as well method. Just like when you are wanting to go to the gym, the hardest part about working out is actually getting to the gym. If you're anything like me and you maybe suffer from ADHD, procrastination, um, you are, have anxiety or any of those kind of things that can, you can put up all of these roadblocks or mental blocks as to why it's going to be too much for you to study. Oh, I don't think I can get in enough time. Oh, there's so many pages I have to read. It's too much. Utilize the might as well method and say, I might as well just read one page. I might as well just read one sentence. I might as well just open the book. I promise you, if you do that, it's a great hack to trick your mind and you think that you're not going to read a full chapter. You tell your brain, you tell your body, just get to the page and read one page. And I promise you, once you start and get to the bottom of the page, you will flip the page and before you know it, you would have read 10 pages. You might have read the whole chapter. You might have found something that you liked and you continued to read, but you never would have worked out if you didn't get to the gym. So literally say out loud, God, I don't want to study. All right, I might as well read just one page. I'm going to read one page. All right, one page. And before you know it, you'll be knocking out page after page after page. And it is better than nothing. Even if you stopped at one page, that is one page more than you had read before, which was zero. All right, this one is easier said than done. Tip number three of 10 best ways to study is to read one lesson ahead. This takes some discipline and it's really challenging, but the benefit is if you read one lesson ahead, when you are in class listening to the lectures, you can sit there and be present and actually absorb 
the information that your instructor is teaching you. If the information that you're hearing is the first time you're hearing about it, you are going to be playing catch up, trying to be taking notes, trying to pay attention, trying not to be distracted rather than going, oh, I have a certain awareness of this. You're already doing this by signing up for the academy. You are already of this mindset. So remember that and do that when you actually start school. One of the things that we talked about back in the other chapters of this, this work workshop was to be prepared for that first day or that first week rather where there are a bunch of chapters coming down the pipe and you need to read ahead. I highly advocate to read five chapters ahead so that when you're sitting in class, you can just sit there and be present and you can ask clarifying questions that focus more on that comprehension that we talked about, right? The comprehension versus the memorization. So you can sit there in class and ask a good question like, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Instructor, I was reading about this and I'm having a hard time understanding the difference between this and this. Can you elaborate that? That's actually what we want to do. That's what we're there for. That's our job. Our job, again, like I said, is not to pour the information into you. Our job is to help you solidify those concepts that you are studying and learning on your own. So easier said than done, but that's why we're here. Read a few chapters ahead so that you know what's coming down the pipe. I promise you it'll help. All right, tip number four is in regards to taking notes while you're in class or while you are studying certain topics within your book. And so one thing that I found to be incredibly useful for taking quick, effective notes while listening to a lecture is to utilize a, um, uh, utilize a technique called mind mapping. And there's a fantastic TED Talk video on YouTube by Hazel Wagner that you can look up that will describe this much more eloquently than I can do. But the basics of it is typically when most people make notes, they make them um, maybe topic one, two, three, A, B, C, dash, 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 whatever way they do it is from the top to the bottom. And that is okay. Uh, but the problem is that instructors don't always lecture from top to bottom and they can bounce all over the place with these different concepts. And sometimes you want to add in information that was brought about about a topic up here when you're down here on your notes and then you lose space to fill it in. And so what's really beautiful about mind mapping is you are going to basically start with a blank sheet of paper. And instead of starting from the top going down, you're going to start in the very center with a circle uh, with, for instance, let's talk about cardiac. Let's say that we're learning about the heart today. And so in the center, you're going to write heart. And then as the instructor talks about certain aspects of the heart, then you're going to make a little map or it looks kind of like a brainstorm cloud where you're going to go, all right, the instructor is talking about the different heart rhythms. So you go heart rhythm. And then as they describe each heart rhythm, you can branch off and put all of the notes. And then all of a sudden the instructor will start talking about the different anatomical um, anatomy of the heart. And so he, they'll go, oh, uh, there's like four chambers and there's the atriums and the ventricles. They're like, oh, we're not talking about that anymore. Okay. Well, then we'll go over here and create a new bubble and then branch off from there. And then if they go, well, actually that part of the heart actually creates this one rhythm. Then you go, oh, we're talking about rhythms. Then you can put it over there. By the time that you're done, you have expanded out what actually mimics the neural pathways of our brain. And so it's really beautiful. You have end up, you end up having a picture note of an easy to follow um, uh, directional space to get to the information that you want. And so when you go back to review these notes, you go, okay, this is my cardiac one. You can go, all right, oh, well, four chambers, and then that must be in that section. And you find it much easier than sifting through three or four pages of the same looking material that you physically have to read. So it's almost like an algorithm or, you know, an internet search. It goes very quickly to the topic that you need. Now, if you want to take this, then you can take that. And then when you go home, convert it into a linear form, transfer it to flashcards, do everything that you want from there. But 
when you do it this way, you can quickly write the information and be more present in class listening rather than focusing on making your, your notes all nice. Another side thing that's really good to this is you have creative art, you know, creative freedom to make these kind of pretty with doodles and different shapes and squiggly lines and arrows and things like that, which for me uh, allows me to have a little bit more fun while I'm sitting there in class rather than making bullet points because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So if I wrote ABC and then all of a sudden I had to add in something and I can't get the letter in there or the dash doesn't match up, it freaks me out, right? It frustrates me. So being able to use uh, a mind map platform is way more beneficial because I'm able to have the freedom to where it's a it's messy, but it's not, and that's okay. And so give that uh, TED Talk a watch. It's not very long. It's by Hazel Wagner on YouTube. It's going to very much help you in taking your notes while you're in class, watching videos, watching YouTube videos, or taking notes in your book. All right, tip number five of the 10 best ways to study is going to be good old fashioned flashcards. I am a huge fan of paper index card flashcards. I think that what a lot of people don't understand is the value is mostly in making the flashcards themselves. I've noticed a big trend in a lot of my students lately is that they're using their iPads, which are phenomenal. They're amazing. And they're able to take the book and, uh, take pictures off of the book and add them into the notes, write notes on the actual slides, um, do all kinds of great things. And I still believe that there's muscle memory associated by writing with a stylist on there. It still has value and I'm into it too, but there's something about actually handwriting the flashcards. And the reason for that is because the uniqueness and the character that's developed in these, when you're handwriting them because of the inconsistencies, you remember, you know, when, when you write it with a stylus on your tablet, um, it auto corrects your, or it can if you use this feature, auto corrects your handwriting. It makes it all look computerized a little bit. It makes it too uniform. And so when you're in test to, test mode and you're trying to draw on these memories, you kind of just see a lot of the same. You're not really seeing something where you remember that you wrote it crooked or you used a different color ink than the other one, or you spilt some of your, you know, your Red Bull on there, your some coffee, or you remember that page was bent, or you remember what it felt like when you switched the cards. There's a lot that happens in the making of the cards and the utilizing of the cards that creates extra memories inside of our brain when it comes test time versus just having a bunch of notes on your tablet um, or not making flashcards at all. There are flashcards that are available on JB Learning. There's also flashcards that are available um, through Quizlet and things like that. They have benefits. I definitely would say utilize them, but nothing is going to work as much as just handwriting old school flashcards. So uh, tip number five is just go old school and do it like that with straight up index cards. Tip number six of the 10 best ways to study is going to be to teach others. This goes back to you having comprehension versus memorization. If you can teach someone else how it works, correctly, then that means that you have comprehension over the topic. And so you can do this by yourself, Just verbalize it out loud. Just say, all right, I'm going to talk about the blood flow of the heart. So this is how it works. It starts with the blood coming from the top of your head and the bottom of your legs going all the way up, dropping into the right atrium. And then it goes around. If you can do that, then that means that you understand it. It's one thing to be able to pick an answer from a bunch of choices, but it's another to be able to stand on your own two feet on your own island and describe it with your own words. And the simpler that you can make it as if you're teaching a fifth grader how this works, then the easier it's going to be for you. So I highly encourage you to start telling your friends and your families all the things that you're learning about. They're excited for you. They're excited about what you're doing and they want to hear about it. And they get gassed up too when you are able to tell them, um, all the things that you learned. So take every opportunity that you have to almost be obnoxious in saying, Hey mom, Hey dad, Hey wife, Hey husband, Hey, whatever. This is why I learned in class today. Did you know this? And they're going to be like, what? 
I didn't know. And I think that that's a great way for you to learn is to teach others. Tip number seven of the 10 best ways to study is going to be utilizing the audiobook. When we talked about using found time earlier on in the workshop, this is where the audiobook is going to come into play. Anytime that you are doing something where you could be listening at the same time, I want you to listen to the audiobook instead of music. Just take a fast, fast for nine weeks of music and podcasts and Netflix and all the things that you normally would be spending your audio time on and replace it with the audiobooks. Another benefit to the audiobook is if you are a, a reader that maybe has a hard time with, with keeping present when you're reading, I know that I will read a sentence and be like, I don't know what the heck I just read, right? Um, listening to the audiobook while you are following along and reading really solidifies and locks it in. And so those are the two ways that I would use the audiobook to help capture the best use of my time while studying. All right, tip number eight for the 10 best ways to study is to utilize voice notes. So I have an iPhone, so I utilize Apple voice notes. But when we get into certain topics like memorizing medications or memorizing these National Registry NREMT sheets, there are specific steps that you need to follow of each of these skills, like showing how to suction and BVM a patient, how to do CPR, apply AED, how to run a medical scenario, a trauma scenario. You will be given at the start of class a, a stack of all of these skills that you'll need to perform in order to pass the class and they have to be done perfectly. You have to memorize the exact order and exactly what to say from top to bottom. And so what I do is I will read the sheet or I will read the drug formulary out loud and record it onto my iPhone. And then I will listen to that over and over and over while I drive. And so I will start out and I'll go, Apple voice note record. This is NREMT medical scenario, BSI scene safe, E names, you know, uh, what's my general impression, uh, my ABCs, my transport decision, my sample history, my OPQRST. I recognize that you guys don't know what I'm talking about, but these are a lot of mnemonics that we have to memorize. These are a lot of steps that we have to memorize. And so if you're learning OPQRST, AEIOU tips, OPASTE, AVPU, GCS, any of these kinds of skills, if you can utilize, if you can put together an entire bank of all of these in your phone and listen to those, this goes along with the audiobooks, and you listen to these during found time, I promise you, you're going to memorize this stuff. It's going to passively absorb into your brain. You guys listen to music, you watch movies, you're not rappers. You're not actors, but you know all of the words to these songs. You know all the inflection. You know all of the, the time to say the right punchlines. And the reason for that is because you've watched it and heard it so many times. You can do this yourself by utilizing voice notes. All right, tip number nine out of the 10 best ways to study is going to be utilizing something called play review. And so what is something that public speakers, athletes, performers all seem to have in common is that they utilize something called play review. If you record yourself doing the skills that you're going to be needing to test on, you can see all of the areas where you need improvement. Sometimes when we're doing something, it's challenging to have an idea about what we're doing right or what we're doing wrong. I know that for myself, I think I'm doing pretty well. For instance, making these videos, I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job doing these videos, but I have been reviewing the tapes. I've had to delete some. They're not great, okay? So we have a lot of ums, likes, filler words, pauses, not looking at the camera, look at the camera too much. It's awkward. It's a challenge to be up here, but it has made me better each time that I've done it. I can't tell you how much better I am at speaking than I was before, and I've still got so much more to go. But when I was in EMT school and paramedic school, play review is one of the best things that you can do to improve your skills, especially when you're doing your medical and your trauma scenarios. So in EMT school, 
at the end, we are going to need to test out our medical and trauma, like we talked about earlier in the workshop. And you are going to have to role play and act out a scenario in front of your proctor and some of your, your uh, fellow students. That's hard, okay? That's really challenging to put yourself out there, be vulnerable, and make mistakes. And so a benefit to play review is that, for one, you can practice at home in the safety of it's just you and the camera. And if you make a mistake, you can just delete it and no one's none the wiser, right? But if you record yourself and you see all the areas where you need improvements, then when you come in on your skills days and practice, then you can tell your, your proctor or the person who's helping you, your instructor, hey, I was doing some play review and I didn't even notice that I had a problem with this, that, and the other. Can you help push me through that, that barrier? Can you help me get past that? Can you tell me a tip on how to remember to ask that question or to do that intervention? And that's where you're going to get improvement. Another reason is you don't want the first time that you practice to be in class in front of everyone else. I'm sorry to say this, but you're wasting your own time, you're wasting an instructor's time, and you're wasting the class's time. We do not have very much time to practice the skills. The classes are impacted. There's only four or so hours available, and there's four groups going at a time with 10 people in each group. And when you break down the numbers of 50 minute rotations, including bathroom breaks, the odds of you going up and being able to practice is going to be minimal. So you want to make the best use of your time in front of an instructor to get positive feedback, right? Or constructive criticism. You also want to be a good example for your other, uh, your other classmates. Wouldn't you rather see someone do well and you can copy that rather than see someone just totally crash and burn and feel really bad? Play review at home is going to help you get the cobwebs out and get all of your weird ticks and all of your insecurities out. And then the great thing about it is once you record yourself and you get that good one, just like the voice notes, you can save that and review it and watch it over and over again and use that as one of your study tools. So play review. Big one, huge one, do it. You're not going to do it. I know you're not, but you need to. Most people don't, but the ones who do, do really well. So I know it's hard to do it. You need to do it. Play review is awesome. All right. Tip number 10 of the 10 best ways to study is going to be repetition and filling in the blank. And so one of my favorite ways to study is going to be taking our concepts, our words, our mnemonics, our um, vocabulary words and repeatedly writing them on a piece of paper, Bart Simpson style over and over and over and over. It's going to create that muscle memory for you. And it's going to be super beneficial. Another thing I like to do is called fill in the blank. And so what I like to do is for the drug formularies or for the mnemonics or for any, anything like, um, uh, anatomy, uh, naming the bones or, the body parts, anything like that, I like to take the picture that I've printed out and then I like to make a copy of it. But on the second copy, I like to white out or if I can print it without the, the words on it, um, blank out all of the words and then sandwich them together into a page divider and make a booklet of study guides where it will have the mnemonics and where the answer is on the backside and then on the front side is the blank version. And then you take a whiteboard marker and you just fill them in and wipe it off and fill it in and wipe it off. It's a great way to save paper. It's a great way to have them all in the same place. And if you can't remember what it is, you just flip it to the other side and look and say, okay, I got it. And if you can fill it in without looking, then you've got it down. And it's a great way to, you know, like I said, not waste paper, keep it all in the same place. And uh, it looks pretty cool. All right, so what are the, some of the best online tools, websites, and apps that are out there available for students for an alternative option to studying? My favorite one is definitely going to be YouTube. Um, Google and YouTube are my go-tos for trying to figure things out. I think that the book is really valuable. All of the answers are in the book. All of the tests are made from the book. The book is very thorough, and so if you utilize the book and you study everything, it will help. 
but I don't know it's always the best for you to grasp comprehension over certain topics. For me, I'm a visual learner or an audible learner. Uh, reading it on the text isn't always the best for me. And so what I like to do is I like to use the book to kind of get an idea of what I need to know. And then as I get through topics, if I want to get a more in-depth understanding of it, or I want to hear it from somebody, I just want someone to tell me how it works. I'm going to go to YouTube. I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to look that up and I'm going to learn it that way. What's great about YouTube is there's a lot of people that are out there that are putting out a lot of great content for people that's easily digestible and in, in, engageable and enjoyable. Um, people like the paramedic coach, master your medics. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, Khan Academy, places like that. Uh, there's a lot of great websites that these individuals are dedicating their lives to helping you understand this information just like I am, uh, just, you know, just like myself. Another great app is going to be called Quizlet. I think a lot of you who are in college are aware of this one, but I think that a lot of the people who did not spend a lot of time in school aren't really aware of this. Quizlet is a little dicey, okay? It's great. But the problem is that it's created by other students. So you're going to see a lot of mistakes in there. They're subtle mistakes. I would say that 90, 80, 90% of the time it's correct. Um, but there's a lot of students that are putting in false information on there. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. So supplement your education with Quizlet, but do not rely on it because we're going to fall into that same trap of memorization and not comprehension. If you have comprehension, you will read that and go, whoa, that ain't even right. Sometimes people will put on the quizzes and the uh, modules from the exams onto Quizlet, uh, which can be bit really beneficial. I'm not going to lie to you and say that it's not there. Um, it's there. If you want to utilize that and if you want to cheat, you can definitely go ahead and do that because it's a free country and you can do whatever you want. Um, but just remember that that should be something that you're doing to maybe double check yourself. And if you know that you are inclined to kind of cheat, then I... I challenge you to try to resist that temptation because you're going into a job of integrity and cheating is only going to get you so far and it's going to get you further away from comprehension. And, and, and I can't stress that enough that the more you know and understand, the better you're going to do out there. And so Quizlet is fantastic if you are hard up the last night and you really didn't study and you need to just kind of crash study. I get it, dude. College is college. Do what you need to do, um, but please don't lean on that. A great app out there is called Pocket Prep, and this will give you a series of questions on their multiple choice for you to practice your test taking. And so we, I encourage that a lot for students after they um, already in school, maybe towards the end of school. Uh, you can start at the beginning of school, uh, but I don't know if, if you'll understand all the topics until later, but a lot of people are using it for national registry, um, national registry preparation. And a lot of people say that's really uh, pretty close to national registry and I advocate for it all the time. So I think it's a, a fantastic app that you should download. Um, speaking of apps, you should also download your local protocol apps. Sometimes it helps for you to understand what your protocols are and what's the scope of practice that you're allowed to do. And it kind of helps solidify and fully understand oh, this is my role, this is my job, these are the things I can do, these are the categories they fall into. Maybe I don't need to fully diagnose and know exactly what the thing is, but I do need to understand how to treat symptoms because we don't diagnose out there in the field, we treat symptoms. We don't have a heart attack protocol, we have a chest pain protocol. So sometimes seeing the protocols helps you understand that a lot better and there are free apps that you can download your local protocols or look at them online. Pinterest. Don't sleep on Pinterest. Pinterest has a lot of visual boards that people make, especially nursing students. That's really valuable. So if you want to know lung sounds, anatomy, things like that, Pinterest boards is a fantastic resource for you. Podcasts are kind of lacking, but there are some out there. And so I would utilize some podcasts if I were you, at least to um, if you are looking for an outlet to kind of have some media or, you know, you would normally be Netflixing or listening to Joe Rogan or something like that, then I would try to shift to a podcast so you can start to pick up all of those words um, because there's a lot of uh, words that surround the culture and uh, EMS words that are used in those podcasts. And it's kind of like if you watch telenovela for enough, you know, enough, you kind of start to learn a little bit of Spanish, right? So if you listen to podcasts enough, you start to understand how EMS works. 
Instagram is fantastic. You guys all know that I love Instagram to death. Um, I think there's a lot of great pages and the same with TikTok. And so I highly encourage you to do something that I is, I'm the only person that I know of that talks about doing this, but the moment you get into EMT school or actually starting right now, I want you to take your Instagram account or your TikTok account, and I want you to create a burner account. Okay. And there's the reason for this. I want you to create a new one that just says EMT student, seven, eight, nine, 10, whatever it is that is, has nothing to do with you or your personality. And you don't post anything on there except EMS related stuff. Here's the ticket. All right. What you're going to do is you're only going to follow EMS pages, follow mine first, right? Ashcraft EMS, but you're going to follow EMS pages, fire departments, um, for, uh, ambulance companies, hashtags like EMS, EMT school, paramedic, EMT, nurse, doctor, lungs, heart, you know, any of those kinds of things. And you are going to trick the algorithm into thinking that that's all you care about. So for mine, all I see is trucks and um, food on my Instagram because that's what the algorithm thinks that I like. And it's true. But on my burner account, it thinks that all I care about is EMS related stuff. So it wants to feed me more. So we have to be smarter than the algorithm. We have to hack the algorithm. So the benefit to this is if you know that on your Instagram, on the bottom right-hand corner, you can toggle between your two accounts. And so what I want you to do is I want you to have your burner account as your primary account while you're in EMT school. And if you find yourself on your personal account, I want you to toggle quickly over to the other one. And then I want you to dedicate time for your personal one because the problem is if you're anything like me, you spend a lot of time on social media and you can get stuck into that endless scroll, searching for that dopamine, looking for the next video. And if you accidentally find yourself trapped in your personal account, you are going to get distracted. So if you switch to your main, your, your main account being your burner account, then when you get on there to get a little relief from studying, uh, which goes against what I said, you should, you'd be blocking out time. But if you're studying while looking at your phone, you're not going to get distracted. And if you do look at something, at least it's going to be EMS related. Uh, last benefit to that is it's going to expand your awareness of the culture. Okay. And so the culture of EMS and the different agencies and the different places you can work and all of those kinds of things are going to be within uh, that Instagram page that you make. And so you might find out that the algorithm says, hey, there's a fire department right down the street from you and you're going to click on it because you're going to follow it and then you're going to find out that they're hiring. Or you're going to find, oh, you know what? I like the social media of that ambulance company. You know what? They seem like a place I might want to interview with. You would have never known about them unless you hacked the algorithm. So right now, I want you to make a burner account, follow me, and then do all of those things, following those hashtags. And I promise you, it's going to put you on game very quick because artificial intelligence and the algorithm is very good at giving you what it thinks it wants, uh, thinks that you need. And so, um, I highly advocate that you do that. All right, everyone, that does it. That completes our workshop. We did a fantastic job staying present and listening to all of those videos. Uh, it was a lot of information to take in, but I just want to acknowledge that it is a huge thing for you to do this, for you to advocate for yourself and for you to uh, invest in your success is one of the best things that you can do to be successful in class. You've already successfully diagnosed your first patient. You recognize that you are in need of help and you prescribed yourself a solution by doing this pre-academy. So great job. We covered a lot of information. So just to recap, we start off with just expressing some gratitude and saying that it's pretty awesome that you chose to go into EMS and start EMT school. And so you should be proud of yourself. I'm proud of you. Your family's proud of you. Your community's proud of you. And I really hope ultimately that you're proud of yourself. Signing up is one of the hardest things to do. And so now you've now signed up for the pre-academy, taken that and you check that off. So don't forget to check off and look back at all the things that you've done. You've combated or you've fought through uh, your anxieties and signed up for class. You 
all successfully diagnosed your first patient yourself and prescribed this class. And now you've completed the pre-academy. And so after that, after that, all you need to do is just apply all these teachings that you learned today. 